What's going on? Chuck here. And I uh, just got done doing some guitar work and uh, I'm pretty exhausted actually. So uh, I'm just hanging out with my boy Chappie. There he is, there he is, there's Chappie. And uh, I wanted to make a video about some of my favorite stories uh, about Robert Guthrie. So uh, if you don't know Robert Guthrie, um, he's been my guitar teacher for about the past 10 years and he just passed away um, you know, several weeks ago at this point. So, you know, I've been thinking back a lot on memories with him and I came up with a, I came up with a list of stories uh, that are my favorite stories about him. And, you know, if you know me personally, or if you knew Mr. Guthrie, you know, you're probably very aware of the huge impact that you know, he's had on my life and on a lot of people. If you don't know him, but you've ever enjoyed anything on my channel or basically anything I've ever done, uh, it is absolutely <laughs> very heavily influenced by him. You know, whether it's guitar playing, whether it's teaching, really doesn't matter what it is. Um, his influence is just all over it. So you've actually still benefited from um, from his life and the things that he did. And, you know, when I started making a list of stories uh, for a video like this, you know, more and more kept coming to mind. And, and I thought, well, I really want to make this video um, mainly so that I don't forget them, <laughs> um, so that I can look back and remember them um, because, uh, you know, I certainly don't want to forget them now that he's moved on. So I came up with a lot of stories. So what I decided to do is I think I'm going to make a few different videos. And in this one, I want to talk about stories that involve him doing amazing things with the guitar. Now, if you just listen to any of the recordings that he made, and I'll, I'll link a playlist um, in the description uh, for you to find. Uh, that has all the recordings that I'm aware of. And if any more come to light, I'll certainly add them. But if you just listen to his recordings, you can, of course, hear the amazing things that he could do with the guitar. But there were also stories that he told. Um, most of these stories he told me in, in lesson, I think, that involve him doing amazing and ridiculous and unbelievable things with the guitar. Um... So I have five of those uh, that I want to talk about in this video. So let's get to it. So the first one, uh, I think this is a story he kind of mentioned to a lot of people. Uh, and he told it something like this. He said that, uh, you know, at some point in his career, he had gotten asked to do a concert and a master class uh, in a different city. I can't remember where it was, so... I mean, certainly typical for somebody like him. So he said he traveled to the city. The first night he was there, he played the concert. Then he said he had a day off after that. And then the day after that was when he was going to teach the master class. And then he flew home after that. So he said the day in between, he said, well, you know, I didn't really know anybody in the area. And I didn't have anything to do. So I was just in my hotel room and I turned on the football game and I got out my guitar and I began to practice scales. And then I practiced scales for eight hours. <laughs> yeah, so an eight hour day of scale practice. Um, totally unbelievable. Uh, and then, so I remember asking him, you know, could you move your hands, you know, the next day where you sore or whatever? And he just said, well, he said, I didn't really feel anything. He said, I remember when I was teaching the class, when I first got out my guitar and started to play, I felt a little bit of like discomfort uh, on the back of my fretboard hand, which is interesting. I, I think I, I would have thought it would have been more of the, the plucky hand. 
But he said, I did feel a little bit of something. And he said, but in about 20 minutes, it went away. And then I was fine. And I just thought, oh my God. I mean, it's one thing to be able to practice scales for eight hours. It's another thing to um, be able to recover like that, almost like it never happened and just go about your business. So, um, and that is something that I am never going to attempt to do. I, I do know someone that's done it. And he's very badass and cool for doing it. But, um, you know, he can also just play hours on end that uh, that I just can't. My, my body won't, won't hold up. I'll start to break down. So I will say, um, you know, like when you're in grad school and you're, you're taking courses and you're having lessons and you're doing rehearsals and you're teaching... I mean, some, some of those days, I remember, you just play all day long. Like, I remember coming home and trying to practice at night and just being totally exhausted and then realizing, oh, right, I've been playing the guitar all freaking day. Like, that's why I'm exhausted. But, you know, I never, like, timed those days out, so I don't know. I don't know about those times. There was one day where I did... My biggest practice I ever had was seven and a half hours of like solo practice time, like just me, uh, where I used to time it on my phone. But that was doing all kinds of stuff. That wasn't just scales. That was uh, learning new pieces and playing old pieces and doing technique and whatever. So, um, you know, having the mental strength, if nothing else, to play scales for eight hours is just totally, totally mind blowing. So. Very impressive, Mr. Guthrie. Um, so the next one also involves scales. Uh, he would talk about scales a lot. So one time, uh, one of my friends uh, in the SMU guitar program, they had a recital. So after the recital, uh, we, were, we were hanging out, just standing around talking. And um, I remember it was me and Mr. Guthrie and uh, Swami Dev. Uh, What's up, Swami Dev, if, if you're watching? Uh, Swami Dev was in Mr. Guthrie's program a while back, like the 70s or 80s. I'm not sure, something like that. But he's known him for a while. So we're talking, and all of a sudden, Swami Dev, um, uh, he, he called him Bob. So he's like, Bob, you know, Bob would be the one to get up at 5 in the morning and practice scales every day. And Mr. Guthrie cuts him off. And I remember he, he was shaking his head like this, and he goes... I never got up at five in the morning to practice scales. And, and we all just kind of stopped talking like, what, what's he going to say next? Like, is this not true? You know, what's the deal? And then he goes, I would get up at 530 to practice scales. <laughs> oh, and it was just hilarious. But like, I mean, he said it with an absolute straight face. Like he was just thinking, no, of course not. Cause I know exactly when I would get up to practice. It was always 5.30 and it was never five because I always knew when I was gonna practice. Um, so uh, I just thought that was really funny. But also certainly showed, you know, the dedication to get up at 5.30 and, uh, and, and do that, uh, do that every day. R- really, really great. Um, the next one, <clears throat> what's the next one? I kind of had these in order. Okay, I know what it is. So, Mr. Guthrie said when he was a kid, I think like teenager years, uh, he was taking lessons with a teacher who he said was like a pretty good teacher, you know, whatever. And I think it may have been like the summertime. I remember him saying he, at that time, had a lot of time to practice guitar. So maybe he wasn't in school, maybe it was summer, something like that. So he said he had a lesson with this guy and he would see him once a week. And and he said they had a lesson and he asked him about learning the Bach Chaconne, the famous D minor uh, Bach Chaconne from the uh, violin partita. And I guess his teacher said, yeah, sure, you know, why don't you start on it? So, Mr. Guthrie went home and started on it. And by his next lesson, he had learned and memorized the whole Bach Chaconne um, as a teenager. (laughs) So, yeah, so that's one week he learned and memorized 
the whole dang thing. If you don't know this D minor boxer cone, it's like 15 minutes long, something like that. And it's, it's like through composed. Um, like there, nothing in the piece repeats. It is a 15 ish long piece from beginning to end uh, where you never play the same thing twice, essentially. Uh, and it's Bach, so it's it's complicated music. It is not it is not by any means uh, easy or simple to play. The last time I heard someone play it in concert, um, it was Dr. Frank, and he said he'd been working on it for three years. He said I needed that much time before I felt com comfortable playing in concert. And when he said that, I just thought, yeah, sounds about right. I mean, good for you. Like you you plan things out, good. Like makes sense. So Mr. Guthrie learns and memorizes the piece in a week. But here's the kicker though. So he goes into his lesson with his teacher and tells him, and his teacher is furious at him for doing that. Like, is very mad at him for learning it and memorizing it so quickly. And all I'm thinking is this guy, he must have just been feeling nothing but jealousy. Like here's this kid asking like, should I learn the box of cone, you know? And comes in the next week, and he's learned and memorized the whole dang thing. And he said his teacher's point was like, well, you shouldn't learn it so fast because you need more time to spend with the music, to, to work on your phrasing and digest it and things like that. And I, I think that's a point to be made, but I'm pretty sure Mr. Guthrie played it for like 50 years after that. So um, I'm sure he had plenty of time to you know, evaluate his fingerings and, and work on his phrasing and, and, do, and do all those things. But yeah, one week, the Bach Chacon, whew, uh, uh, amazing. I don't know if I'll ever get around to that piece, but um, certainly it's a very beautiful piece. Um, the next story uh, is also about, is about Bach music. So um, two of the recordings we have of Mr. Guthrie are um, Bach's cello suites. He did the first one and he did the third one. And I don't remember if this is about the first, I don't know if this story pertains to the first one or the, or the third one, but it's one of those. And, uh, you know, Mr. Guthrie would sometimes talk about guitars that he had, because like a lot of guitarists, you know, he, he had multiple guitars in his life and, and then they would kind of come in and out. He would have one for a while and he'd sell it and, and, and things like that. And, um, the main guitar that he talked about the most that he said was the best guitar he ever owned was a 664 scale, which is big, Cedar Top Miguel Rodriguez. He talked about that guitar like it was God's gift to guitarists, okay? And that is predominantly what he used to record. Almost all his recordings were made on the Rodriguez. Um, the bulk of them. And he said that was the one guitar that he wished he had back. Um, and he just loved that guitar. At one time I went to a lesson and he had found like a, like a Seek Us video or GSI or whatever. And he'd found this guy playing a Rodriguez. And he was like, come over and listen, listen to these sounds and listen to this guitar. So I was listening and I was like, yeah, this sounds great. And he just goes, mm, mine was way better. <laughs> <laughs> so um so he loved this guitar so whatever bach cello suite this was he decided to record it on a different guitar not the rodriguez and i can't remember what that guitar was but i think i remember it being something spruce topped so a uh, pretty pretty different sound right so he goes to the studio and he records the full cello suite all the movements on this spruce top guitar Gets it done, right? No big deal there. You know, just go ahead and record your whole box cello suite in a day. Uh, no, no biggie. So he does the recording, and um, then he said the engineers sent him home with a, with a copy on CD to go home and listen to. So he said he went home, and he listened to it um, that night, and he said as he was listening to it, he started to think, I really should have recorded this on my Rodriguez. 
And then he said after that, he thought, I'm gonna have to re-record the whole thing on my Rodriguez. <laughs> so the next day, he goes back into the studio and re-records the whole suite on the Rodriguez. <laughs> and that's the recording that we have, whatever one it is. Like, it's a top-notch, professional-level recording. Um, and I just think it's amazing. It shows the level on which he is thinking. You know, if I could get a decent recording of a Bach cello suite on any guitar, I would probably be very happy with that. I would be happy to have the recording and I would be like, oh my God, I'm done with that project. But to have the mindset of like, you know, the, the sound just was not as fitting as he could imagine it being. And he just, he just couldn't have that. So he goes in the next day and he records the whole, the whole freaking thing again. So absolutely amazing. And I did ask him about that spruce top recording. I said, so is this, is, is there another recording of this Bach cello suite uh, that you played, you know, floating around? And he just said, oh, I don't know. I think I lost it. it you know, he, he didn't keep up with stuff like that. So who knows? It, it may be out there somewhere. Um, the rejected uh, Guthrie Bach cello suite. <laughs> that, that, um, that didn't sound as good as the Ramirez. I mean the Rodriguez guitar. Um, okay, so I think that's four. The last story I have um, is about guitar concertos. So if you don't know what a concerto is, um, in our modern lingo, you know, it, it will mean that uh, it's a piece written for orchestra and a solo instrument. So it could be a guitar concerto, a violin concerto, a piano concerto, a voice concerto. I think there's a kazoo concerto. I mean, there's all kinds of concertos. So um, it's usually a big piece, like 20 to 30 minutes, usually multiple movements. It's like kind of a big deal. So, you know, if you go see a famous player in town, they will play a concerto with like the Dallas Symphony or the Fort Worth Symphony or whatever, it's what they do, right? So, um, typically I think people play one concerto per concert. I mean, occasionally you might see more than that. Um, a couple times I've played two, uh, two concertos in a concert. Mr. Guthrie once played a concert with four guitar concertos. <laughs> Four, four. So I, I remember him saying, I think it was Illyrio Diaz. Uh, Illyrio Diaz was one of the people that he studied with and, uh, and he really admired and learned a lot from. And I think he said Illyrio once played a concert with three guitar concertos. So he just wanted to see if he could do one with four. And by golly, uh, it sounds like he sure did. Um, you know, like pretty much all of his performances, I, I wish, you know, someone had, you know, set up a mic or two and, and hit the record button. But, um, as far as I know, that didn't happen. And, um, you know, concertos are a lot of work. Like I said, they're big pieces. And then depending on what you play, um, they can certainly be a lot of work. But he said he, he in the first half of the program, he played two Vivaldi concertos. Um, the famous D major one, and I don't know what the other one was, but it was another Vivaldi. And in the second half, he played the Ponce Concerto and the Arnwes at the end. Like, no big deal. And I have played the Arnwes, and that piece is a lot of freaking work. So, just to throw that in at the end, like, yeah, you know, three other concertos and also the Arnwes. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. So, you know, those are just some examples that came to my mind of him just doing <laughs> otherworldly things as a guitarist and a musician. And, uh, you know, they make me laugh. They make me amazed. Um, some of them inspire me. Some of them make me say, yeah, I don't ever want to do that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's really amazing. <laughs> um, so, uh, it really lifts my spirit to actually uh, talk about these stories. 
Um, I think I'm going to make a couple other videos like this. Uh, I think I want to make one about uh, some things he did for me personally or stories that um, that involve me in them in ways that he affected my life and changed in my life. And I think I want to make one about him as a teacher. Um, you know, stories that involves him teaching me or other people. Um, just ways that I saw him act because those things were extremely impactful and uh, for anyone that's interested in him or you know knowing more about him I certainly don't want to leave those things out but I ended up coming up with a bunch of stories and I didn't want to make a super duper long video uh, this one's probably long enough so I decided to chop it up and I think I'm gonna make a couple more and share some more stories so um, let's see if Chappie Yep, he's still, he's still asleep, so he missed all the stories. But um, anyway, uh, thanks for listening, uh, and uh, you know maybe I'll be telling you some more uh, Mr. Guthrie stories soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye. You missed all the stories. I told all the stories, and you slept through them all. You didn't hear them. You missed the stories. You missed all the stories.